Hello, my favorite listener, and welcome to episode 21. Today I'm going to be discussing in detail the mechanisms of evolution. Last episode I discussed in great detail natural selection, the most powerful and influential phenomenon fueling the evolution of life on Earth. Today I'm going to discuss the other influential forces that contribute to evolutionary change. But first, let me briefly recap natural selection. So natural selection is a process by which the frequency of certain alleles in a population changes. Alleles that promote fitness and reproductive success are generally preserved and passed on through the generations, while alleles that diminish fitness gradually die out. It's important to understand that natural selection doesn't create new alleles or traits. It only sorts existing traits based on their propensity to encourage reproduction. This selection of high-fitness individuals over great periods of time, throughout generation after generation, gradually produces adaptations within the population. No other mechanism of evolution can produce adaptations, but this doesn't mean these mechanisms are unimportant. If natural selection only chooses which alleles get passed on, then that implies that natural selection has a gene pool full of alleles from which to choose. Three other processes can affect the gene pool and thus the evolution of a population, although remember that they aren't responsible for developing any adaptations. Only natural selection can do that, and it takes many, many generations. I'll get into each mechanism of evolution in much greater detail, but first let me briefly summarize them all. The first of these mechanisms is called genetic drift, which is the random fluctuation of allele frequencies in a population. The second is called genetic flow, which involves the gain or loss of alleles as individual organisms move and interbreed between different populations. The third mechanism is mutation, which introduces new alleles by altering the DNA and causing a change to some pre-existing allele. To really understand how these mechanisms work, I need to first explain a mathematical concept called the Hardy-Weinberg principle. I won't go into the technicalities and mathematics of the Hardy-Weinberg principle, But I do want to go over its fundamental assumptions and how the principle is used to understand the evolution of real-world species. The scientists G. H. Hardy and Wilhelm Weinberg reasoned that every allele in the gametes of a given population could be labeled as a gene pool. So every allele in a population is the gene pool. From within the gene pool of this population, of this group of interbreeding individuals, gametes would combine and fertilize to form offspring offspring that possessed the specific alleles of the gametes that created them. Hardy and Weinberg worked out the math on how allele frequencies would change in static, mathematically ideal populations, finding that those groups that reproduced and recombined their alleles with perfect randomness would not experience any change in allele frequencies at all. The Hardy-Weinberg principle is a mathematical model that operates under several assumptions. First, that all mating is entirely random, perfectly random. Individuals don't choose their mates. They're perfectly indiscriminate. Second, it assumes that natural selection does not apply. In the mathematical model, it's assumed that no individuals are killed through natural selection, and all individuals get to reproduce. Third, all alleles in the gene pool are not affected by genetic drift, gene flow, or mutations. Taken all together, the Hardy-Weinberg principle is a mathematical model that predicts what happens to genes in a gene pool under no evolutionary pressures or changes at all. You might be thinking, what good is this? Every population is subject to natural selection and genetic drift and mutations, right? Well, yes. Yes, they are. The Hardy-Weinberg principle allows us to predict how allele frequencies will change with no evolutionary input at all. This is actually really valuable because we can then compare the model to real-world populations where we detect changes and differences in the real-world population from the allele frequencies and the predictions of the Hardy-Weinberg equation, we can tell that some evolutionary effect or phenomenon is at work here. The Hardy-Weinberg principle is like a null hypothesis, paramount to no change or no effect. If the allele frequencies of real-world populations don't conform to the Hardy-Weinberg principle, then we can deduce that some evolutionary variable is acting on the population. If the allele frequencies of real-world populations don't conform to the Hardy-Weinberg principle, then we can deduce that some evolutionary variable is present and acting on the population. Okay, let's start with genetic drift. This phenomenon of genetic drift happens to all populations that reproduce sexually, 
The drift is the random fluctuations in allele frequency from generation to generation. This sounds a little complex, so let me break it down. Multiple alleles of a particular gene exist in a population, and the proportion of individuals with a given allele in the current living population is called the allele frequency. Over long periods of time, natural selection will increase the frequency of alleles associated with high fitness and decrease the frequency of alleles associated with low fitness. If you look at a graph of allele frequencies over a period of like a million years, you'll see smooth lines going up or down representing the slow evolution of the population. But if you zoom in and you look at the lines on the graph over short periods of time, like a generation or 10 generations or 100 generations, you'll see a lot of noise, a lot of random fluctuations in the frequency. This is genetic drift. But that isn't quite a sufficient enough explanation. I need an example to really illustrate how this drift works. All my textbooks offer a pretty simple, effective example, so I'll just share that with you. Imagine a population with two individuals. They each have a gene, for some trait, and for this gene, they're both heterozygous, for alleles A1 and A2. So this population has two individuals, which means the population has four alleles, as each gene is associated with two alleles, you know, on either copy of the genome. There are two A1 alleles and two A2 alleles in the population. Each of the two alleles exists in 50% of each individual. So in the total population, the allele frequency is 0.5, or 50%. If these two individuals reproduced and gave birth to five offspring, genetic drift predicts a random change in the allele frequencies, largely due to this independent assortment of alleles in meiosis. So let's look at the genotype of each child. Each parent has the genotype A1A2, they're heterozygous, you know, they're, they're heterozygous for the gene. But each parent can only pass on one of these alleles to each child. You know, only one allele goes into a particular gamete, and that gamete goes on to fertilize the other gamete and make another offspring. So if a child gets both A1 alleles from their parents, if they get an A1 allele from their dad and an A1 allele from their mom, then the child's genotype will be A1A1. They'll be homozygous for allele A1. If a child gets both A2 alleles from their parents, then the child's genotype will be A2A2. They'll be homozygous for allele A2. If a child gets one of each allele from either parent, then they too will be heterozygous with the genotype A1A2. In short, each child can have the genotype A1A1, A2A2, or A1A2. So our hypothetical population of two has five offspring. Two of the offspring are heterozygous, with the genotype A1A2. Two more are homozygous for the A1 allele, possessing the genotype A1A1. The fifth offspring is homozygous, A2A2. In this generation, there are five individuals, so there are ten alleles. But due to the independent assortment of alleles, there are six A1 alleles, and four A2 alleles. So in this new generation, the A2 allele composes only 40% of the alleles in the population. The A1 allele composes 60% of the alleles in the population. In the parent generation, both alleles existed at a frequency of 50%, or 0.5. And in the offspring generation, the A2 alleles became less frequent, existing at a frequency of 0.4, and the A1 allele became more frequent, existing at a frequency of 0.6. This is a fluctuation in allele frequency due to random chance. This is genetic drift. It's important to understand that this genetic drift effect is not dependent on fitness. It's a totally random fluctuation, based on the randomness of allele assortment and meiosis. As you can see from our example, in small populations like 5 or 10 individuals, or even 100 individuals or so, genetic drift can induce large fluctuations in allele frequency. In small populations, it's possible for an allele to become very common or very rare in a very short period of time, you know, in just a few generations or so. In some cases, the allele can reach fixation, where every individual possesses the allele. When this happens, the allele is passed down to 100% of the offspring in 100% of future generations. It's basically become an integrated part of the entire population, an integrated part of their genome. In other cases, the allele can be entirely lost from a population due to these random fluctuations. When this happens, no individuals possess the allele anymore, so it never gets passed down. It's basically been wiped out from existence as far as the gene pool of that particular population is concerned. In larger populations, the law of large numbers reduces the effective genetic drift.
because there are many individuals and even more alleles, the random fluctuations of genetic drift can only induce relatively small changes in the allele frequency. Thus, larger populations are less likely to have a trait go to fixation or be eliminated due to the randomness of genetic drift. Genetic drift also plays a role when populations settle new places, or when huge portions of the population are killed off by some disaster. Say we have a population of lizards living in a jungle somewhere. This is a big population, you know, there's a lot of lizards, and they have a bunch of genes with a bunch of different alleles. The lizard population has certain allele frequencies, you know, whatever they happen to be. Now let's say that a small subset of these lizards, like a group of 20 or 30 individuals or so, let's say that this small group of lizards wanders downstream and finds a new part of the forest to live in. They're the first lizards in this new area, and so they make it their home. This small group of lizards is the foundation of a whole new population, each individual lizard a founding member. Now consider their alleles. Just from sampling bias alone, it's highly unlikely that this little founder population will have the exact same allele frequencies as their parent population. This new population will almost certainly have slightly different allele frequencies based on the random alleles of the individuals who happen to migrate. This is called a founder effect, where genetic drift sees the emergence of new populations with unique allele frequencies. This also happens during disasters like droughts or famines or fires, where most of the population is wiped out. The number of alleles is drastically reduced as the population experiences a genetic bottleneck. The small group of survivors almost certainly has different allele frequencies than the larger pre-disaster population. This is genetic drift in action. It should be noted that in these examples, genetic drift tends to decrease genetic variety. As the random fluctuations of drift cause alleles to get, uh, to get lost or go to fixation, genetic variety decreases. So instead of founding new populations or surviving disasters, what happens when individuals move and breed between two or more different populations? What happens when an individual bison migrates from one herd to another? Or when an individual goose moves from one flock to a new flock? When a wolf leaves one pack to join another? or when a human moves across the world to live in a new country. This causes a phenomenon called gene flow. The migrating individual takes their alleles out of one gene pool and flows into another. The old gene pool loses that individual's alleles, and the new population gains the alleles. In this way, gene flow can promote genetic diversity within a population by bringing in exotic foreign alleles. On a larger scale, gene flow slowly works to make populations more similar on a genetic level, more homogeneous by blending traits together. Look at it from a statistical point of view. Let's say we have two populations of eagle. One population lives on the east side of a valley, and the other population lives on the west side of the valley. The east side population has a high frequency of A1 alleles, while the west side population has a high frequency of A2 alleles. If individuals in the east side population are more likely to have an A1 allele, then just by chance alone, it's more likely for any random eagle from this population to have an A1 allele than not. When they migrate to the west side population, these individuals carry mostly A1 alleles with them, which they mix into the west side gene pool that has mostly A2 alleles. And this works in the reverse direction, where individuals from the west side are more likely to have A2 alleles, which they then spread through gene flow into the east side population. Over time, both the east and west side eagle populations gradually normalize their allele frequencies, becoming more and more homogeneous. This works in a very similar manner to diffusion, which is a process that equalizes the concentrations of various solutes in solutions connected by permeable membranes. This is also very similar to modern global human societies, as technology becomes more developed and the world gets more interconnected, we're seeing people migrating from all over the world to distant lands far from their home country. People from all over Asia and Africa are migrating into North America and Europe. Europeans and North Americans are migrating out to Asia and Africa in increasingly large numbers as these regions become more economically developed and integrated into the global community. If we look at the human species over time span of the last 1,500 years, we see massive amounts of gene flow. During the Islamic Golden Age, people from the Middle East migrated north into Russia, across the Silk Road into China and India, west across the Maghreb of Africa, across the Northern Sahara, even going so far as Spain. In later centuries, Europe became a big exporter of its genetic influence, 
Genes flowed during the Crusades, when Christian warriors would meet and marry women from the lands they invaded. Then later on, when European kingdoms began colonizing Africa and Indochina, their genes flowed into these regions and persisted. When colonists came to the Americas, there was both gene flow and genetic drift. Many Protestant colonies from Britain and France, as well as many Spanish colonies in Mesoamerica, established themselves as new populations. These were founder events, where the colonists created new populations with new allele frequencies relative to the populations they left behind, back across the Atlantic Ocean. As the colonies grew, the people interbred with the people native to the North and South American continents. This was gene flow, creating individuals with mixed alleles and building genetic similarity between the two populations. In the most recent centuries, gene flow can be seen in the African and Middle Eastern immigrants moving to Europe and North America, as well as Asian immigrants moving to Africa, Europe, and the Americas. In the modern day, the vast majority of these migrations are economically motivated, as people move between countries in search of jobs, financial opportunities, and better living conditions. In this way, economic and technological developments are heavily influencing the gene flow of the human species on a global level. This technological and genetic synergism, this planet-wide interconnectedness, is making all human populations on the planet more and more genetically homogenous. It was slow at first, but in our 21st century world with commercial airplanes and the global internet, this process is rapidly accelerating. Think about that. Anyways, much like genetic drift, gene flow is random with respect to fitness. The fluctuations of genetic drift can cause an allele to go to fixation, even if the allele doesn't really offer any fitness benefits. And it can even cause an allele to be lost, despite that allele possibly offering some kind of fitness benefit. In much the same way, gene flow can reduce or improve the average fitness of the population, depending on the particular alleles that are being introduced. If the host population has low genetic variety, then the introduction of new alleles is good, as this would provide more variety and improve the health of the gene pool. If the host population has good genetic variety and a relatively high average fitness, then it's more likely that new alleles being introduced through gene flow will actually lower the average fitness. The new alleles could be said to pollute the host gene pool with their low fitness. For example, this can happen when hatchery-raised trout are released into the wild, where they interbreed with wild trout populations. The hatchery-raised trout usually have a lower fitness, and their gene flow causes the average fitness of the wild trout populations to slowly decrease. So now it should be clear that both genetic drift and gene flow are entirely random processes. It should also be clear that genetic drift reduces genetic diversity through fixation or loss of alleles. Gene flow can also reduce genetic diversity in a population through the loss of alleles as individuals leave to go find other populations to live and breed with. You might be wondering, if all of these things reduce genetic diversity, and gene flow only increases diversity in populations by spreading pre-existing alleles around, then how does this all-important genetic diversity get generated in the first place? Well, independent assortment and recombination during meiosis produces genetic diversity by mixing up alleles. But what generates those alleles in the first place? What is responsible for making all these alleles, all these variations of our genes? The answer to all these questions is mutation. I saved mutations for last, because if out of all the mechanisms for evolution, mutations are by far the most fascinating and the most freakishly unpredictable. I discussed mutations several times before in the series on genetics, but in this episode I'm going to discuss how mutations work in an evolutionary context. There are three general kinds of mutations that can influence evolution. First, we can have point mutations, which are mutations that change the DNA sequence itself. If a point mutation alters a protein-coding gene, the protein may have a different amino acid sequence, which can alter its effectiveness. If the point mutation alters a regulatory gene, then it can interfere with the proper regulation of whatever biochemical pathway that gene is involved with. Second, there are what scientists call chromosome-level mutations. This involves mutations to an entire gene, or to entire chromosomes. In some cases, a gene may be deleted entirely. In others, the gene may be duplicated in whole, such that the individual now has two or three copies of a gene that their parents only have one copy of. Sometimes entire chunks of the chromosome can get flipped backwards, or swapped with a chunk from an entirely different chromosome. The third type of mutation is called lateral gene transfer, which is a mechanism by which non-related bacteria and archaea 
can literally trade genes with one another. This process can potentially generate tremendous genetic diversity, but it's still being studied, so for the purposes of brevity, I'll focus mostly on point mutations and chromosome level mutations. These two types of mutations are important to understand, because they can explain the existence of alleles. Let's say we have a gene for some trait, and this gene only has a single allele. Every member of the population has one copy of the gene, and for this gene, they all have the same allele, that same one copy. But one day, an individual is born with a chromosome-level mutation. Instead of one copy of the gene, they have two copies. And so this individual reproduces, and his offspring reproduce, and so on, and his genotype, with two copies of the gene, is spread throughout the gene pool. More and more individuals have two copies of the gene. Now, on some day, several generations later, one of these individuals experiences a point mutation to a copy of their gene. The gene is slightly altered, and this creates a new version, a new allele, distinct from the original allele. As this individual reproduces, the new allele gets spread around the gene pool. The duplication followed by a point mutation led to the generation of a new allele, which is now spreading throughout the gene pool. Understand that this was a super simplified example. In the real world, any population with thousands and thousands of individuals will have dozens of new mutations appear every generation in all sorts of different genes. Not every mutation is so lucky as to spread throughout a gene pool. This is where randomness comes in. Organisms don't get to choose when they get mutated, or how the mutation will affect them. If a burst of UV radiation hits some of your DNA, it could potentially hit any random nucleotide base. This could cause a silent mutation where nothing noticeably changes, or it could cause a missense or a nonsense mutation, which will almost always interfere in a negative way with the regulation or protein function. In the vast majority of cases, mutations cause either no effect, or they have a negative effect on the host organism. Usually it's a negative effect. You see, organisms are sculpted by natural selection to fit in with their environment. At any given point in time, the genes they have, the traits they have, are typically well-suited to their habitat. The vast majority of mutations just get in the way. They disable proteins, or they mess with the regulation of protein expression, and this causes the organism to develop malformations, or to suffer from sterility or mental retardation, or it worsens its health in any number of a million different ways. But in very rare cases, a mutation might make an allele better than the original. A mutation could change the amino acid sequence of a protein in such a way as to make it more efficient or more effective at its job, or to give the protein a whole new chemical function that provides some unique service or gives some novel benefit to the organism. A beneficial mutation could potentially interfere with a regulatory gene in a way that makes it more effective, or that causes some kind of developmental pattern that makes the organism stronger or more able-bodied. For example, a mutation to a regulatory gene controlling the concentration of muscle proteins could produce an individual with very dense, powerful muscles. If these stronger muscles can provide some kind of fitness advantage, like it would to an animal who has to fight to catch its food, or fight to compete and earn a mate, then the mutation is beneficial, and it'll likely be preserved and spread throughout the gene pool as a new allele. Alleles are beneficial when they improve the fitness of an organism, when they allow the individual to reproduce more often, which spreads the mutated allele or alleles throughout the gene pool. To fuel your imagination, consider these examples. A population of mice has white fur, but an emergent mutation with the pigment gene gives an individual brown fur. This little brown mouse can hide in the grassy fields better than his white-furred brethren, so he's better camouflaged, and he can better evade predators. This mutation improves his fitness, as he's more likely to survive and reproduce, and the brown fur allele gets spread throughout the mouse gene pool. Consider a population of microbes living in the ocean, feeding off of some kind of substrate. All the microbes are sharing a food source, competing with one another to avoid starvation. And then one day an individual microbe is born with a mutation to a protein involved in digestion, and this makes him slightly more effective at processing energy from his food source. This mutated microbe can produce more energy and survive a little longer with the same amount of food than any of his cousins, so he's less likely to starve. The microbe is more likely to survive and duplicate, increasing the number of individuals in the gene pool with his mutant genes. Consider a population of owls who track their prey from above before swooping down to strike. One of these owls gets a mutation to a regulatory gene for his feathers, 
and during development, his feathers grow slightly differently, and they allow him to stay quiet as he swoops and flies down through the air. The mutant owl is quieter, more stealthy, and he has better luck sneaking up on prey. He's more successful at feeding himself than his noisier owl family. The mutant owl is thus better fed, healthier, more likely to reproduce. His mutant genes spread throughout the gene pool, and over evolutionary lengths of time, the population of owls becomes quieter, more subtle, stealthy hunters. Consider the human species. All humans possess genes coding for the enzymes that break down the sugars in milk. It's just that these genes are only active during infancy, when we're still breastfeeding. Once we grow out of infancy, these genes get shut down and we no longer produce the enzymes. We can't break down the milk sugar and we become lactose intolerant. But as humans began practicing agriculture, we started to use animals not just for meat and labor, but for their byproducts like milk, which we could drink as a liquid or turn into cheese or yogurt or mix with like wheat to make pancakes or you know whatever, it had a lot of different uses. It was very nutritionally valuable. The human populations like the Scandinavians and the Russians who raised milk producing animals like cows and goats would inevitably use their milk as a food source. In times of struggle, animal milk could be a more reliable food source than agricultural crops. And these human populations experienced a selection pressure for being able to metabolize milk past infancy. If you could use milk as a food source, then it was an option for you to eat. You were less likely to starve if your other options failed. Like if you had a weak harvest, or if you had a disease and you had no harvest, or if you went on a string of unsuccessful hunts. As a result, a mutation to the genes that allowed these humans to retain lactose tolerance was preserved by natural selection. They adapted the ability to use the milk as a food source for their entire lives, rather than just in infancy. Compare this to the human populations who rarely or never raised milk-producing cattle, like those of Sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia. These populations never experienced the selection pressures for being able to digest milk past infancy. So any mutation that would have enabled the ability wasn't strongly selected for, and these populations remained largely lactose intolerant. If you want to read more about this phenomenon, I suggest starting with the Wikipedia article on lactose persistence. It's absolutely fascinating, and it ties human evolution together with anthropology, sociology, and archaeology. If you enjoy milkshakes and four cheese pizza, you can thank your milk drinking ancestors and all their cows and goats. All right, I think that covers it. This was a long and intense episode. I feel like I didn't even get to cover that much technical information. I just, I just needed to get out example after example to illustrate the evolutionary mechanisms in action. I hope you learned something cool from all this, and I hope you found it as fascinating as I do. As always, thanks for listening. to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below.